Anyway, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We are joined here today by the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario as they come to Queen's Park to stand up for their 70,000 members. I want to welcome every teacher here today and take a moment to recognize all teachers in the classrooms across Ontario. Thank you for what you do. They deserve the safest possible classroom. They deserve the best resources to create a world-class learning environment. But it seems the government disagrees. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier finally put students and teachers first rather than this government's own political agenda? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, I want to reinforce the welcome uh, to all of the, the teachers who are here and all of their representatives. Uh, there is um, there is nothing more important in this province than the start that we give to our youngest children, Mr. Speaker, and and right through their education careers, Mr. Speaker, that they have the supports in place. I got involved in provincial politics, as did so many people in our, uh, in our government, Mr. Speaker, because of publicly funded education, because of the challenges that publicly funded education was facing at the hands of a government that actually didn't believe in publicly funded education, Mr. Speaker, actually was pushing, was pushing children into the private system. So, Mr. Speaker, the member, the member from when we the came into office— when we came into office, Mr. Speaker, there were no caps on uh, early years, Mr. Speaker. There was no full-day kindergarten. The graduation rate in this province was 68 percent. Thank you. Supplementary. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock. We may be headed down Testy Tuesday, and um, I, I will I will pass the test, and it will not be Testy Tuesday. I uh, I brought that on myself, I guess. But I'm going to ask you all to kind of tone it down. Uh, if not, I'll bring it down. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again uh, to the Premier. That response coming from a premier that has 600 schools on the chopping block. So much for support for public education. You know, Mr. Speaker, EPFO supported the Ontario Autism Coalition's call for this Liberal government to finally and truly support students with autism and special education needs. EPFO President Sam Hammond said, both the coalition and ETFO are emphatic that the Ontario the member from Ancaster. Education needs to overhaul its funding for special education. Question. And the first step to that overhaul is a proper review. So if you are committed to special education, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, will you heed this ETFO call Thank you. and have a review on your special education funding? Mr. Speaker, uh, we will work closely with ETFO. I want to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that all of the supports and resources are in place so that children have the best learning environment possible and so that uh, teachers and education workers have the safest and the best working environments possible, Mr. Speaker. You know, we have, we have worked in partnership with our education federations, Mr. Speaker, yes. with the unions, to develop policies that are in the best interest of kids. We've also, Mr. Speaker, built 810 new schools in this wow. province, Mr. Speaker. There have been major renovations to 780, so we are paying close attention to the working conditions and the learning conditions of kids in the system, Mr. Speaker, and at the same time, those physical conditions are extremely important. So will Answer. we work in partnership with that foe? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker, we will. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, there, again to the Premier, there was no response to EDFO's call for review of special education. The reality is we know that four out of five school boards say they spend more on special education funding than they receive from the province. And because of that, EDFO's Building Better Schools platform says this, directly from EDFO. Often school boards are strapped for funds and are compelled to take money Bangary. that has been allocated to other program areas to support special education, which leaves every kid at a loss. Mr. Speaker, 
School boards should not have to choose between which children to support. They should be able to support all children, all students. Mr. Speaker, that's not happening in Ontario today because of this government's lack of commitment to public education. So my question again, EDFO has asked for a review of the special education funding. Question. Yes or no, will the Premier honour that request? Mr. Speaker, I was very clear in my, in my uh, previous answer that we will work in partnership with EDFO, Mr. Speaker. I, you know, I, can't, I can't be more emphatic that it is incredibly important for us as a government to work with the people who are on the front lines in our schools, Mr. Speaker, who understand the issues. That's why we've increased special education funding by billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker. That's why we put in place the Provincial Health and Safety Working Group. If there is more that we need to do, Mr. Speaker, we will absolutely work with our— Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know, um, we would not have increased the funding for special education by 70% yes, since 2003 if we didn't believe that there was a need 70%. to support kids, all kids, in our school system. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, did the Minister of Energy receive consent? to release Kisco's private billing information, yes or no? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in relation to Kisco, it's great that uh, we work with our, our partners with Electra, Mr. Speaker, and Electra works with Kisco, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, Electra um, was the one that said they will qualify for the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. Just like thousands of other businesses, Mr. Speaker, right across our province will qualify for the ICI program thanks to this government, Mr. Speaker. I know on that side, Mr. Speaker, they don't have a plan. They have no plan for electricity. They have no plan for Ontario. Mike. Not my concern. Do you want to carry on a conversation? We're inching towards warnings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as we say, every business that has 500 kilowatts Answer. or above, Mr. Speaker, will qualify for the ICI program. We want every business in Ontario that qualifies to sign up Thank you. so they can get the help, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, my question was, did the Minister of Energy receive consent to release this private billing information from Kisco. There was no response from the minister on that. He obviously did not seek consent. So my question, Mr. Speaker, is did the Minister of Energy breach privacy laws when discussing Kisco's private billing information? If that happened, can we expect an apology to Kisco from the Minister of Energy? Order, please. So, Minister. so the party doesn't have a plan on what to do with electricity. They don't have a plan on what to do for Ontario, but they... Come to order. So they ask a question, they ask a question about a business that won't qualify, and we clarify it for them, Mr. Speaker, just like we do every day, that they will qualify, Mr. Speaker. The member from Northwest Glenbrook, Niagara West Glenbrook, come to order. And would you mind stopping using your hands as a megaphone? <laughs> Order. Uh, wrap up, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when it comes to businesses as promise, we're going to continue to work with all of the businesses. We're going to continue to work with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce to make sure, sure that as many businesses out there that qualify for ICI get on the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, I'm not sure he appreciates the seriousness of this issue. 
Mr. Speaker, the member told the House this, I quote, they actually have 600 kilowatts of power. We confirmed with Electra, their, their electric company, that they qualify for the ICI program. We know that is not true. They don't qualify for that program. We know they didn't have consent to release those numbers. So my question is this, Mr. Speaker, how does this government have the audacity to release information, incorrect information, by the way? Can the minister be trusted with private information? Is there no contrition from this minister for doing what was clearly wrong? Member from Nipissing, come to order. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, thousands of businesses in this province will qualify for the ICI program knowing that they use more than 500 kilowatts of power, Mr. Speaker. That's the one thing that we talk about all the time. They don't have a plan to help businesses, Mr. Speaker. They don't. They don't know what to do for businesses. We do, Mr. Speaker. From the We're Cain helping Carlton them come to with order the ICI time. program, the Industrial Conservation Initiative, providing businesses with saving up to one-third on their electricity bill. Wow. We are also there, Mr. Speaker, with that business last week with OMAFRA announcing a grant for program for that as well, Mr. Speaker. Not only are we helping this business and many businesses right across the province with energy, we're actually helping them with grants too, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This year's Sunshine List revealed that even within the public sector in Ontario, a massive wage gap for women still persists. Only 25 per cent of the people on the list in 2017 were women. If the Premier can't get this right in her own house after her party has been in charge for more than 14 years, how does she expect the people of this province to trust that she is working to close the wage gap for all Ontario women? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Premier. We know that closing the wage gap is an extremely important imperative, Mr. Speaker. We have been taking action. Um, we're committed to we're committing committed to getting there, Mr. Speaker. Um, whether it is setting a target for women to make up at least 40% of public appointments to every provincial board and agency by 2019, and Mr. Speaker, I would just say that across all of those agencies and boards, we're actually at 44%. But that doesn't mean that every single one is uh, at 40%, and that. That is, our, that is our commitment, encouraging businesses to appoint more women to their boards of directors, Mr. Speaker, um, or whether it's the direct funding increases that we put into salaries for personal support workers and early childhood educators and developmental support workers, uh, the vast majority of whom are women, Mr. Speaker. Those are all initiatives that this government has taken to work to close that wage gap, Mr. Speaker. Uh, speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier and her ministers have said they'll try to put more women in more important roles in the public sector. She has asked the Toronto Stock Exchange nicely if they would please promote more women to their boards. Speaker, what women in this province need now is concrete action. Encouraging, asking nicely isn't enough anymore. When will the Premier take this issue seriously and commit to enforcing tough measures to ensure that women in this province don't have to go to work and wonder if their male counterparts are still making more money than they are. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the President of the Treasury Board will want to speak to this, but I will, I will acknowledge, you know, Mr. Speaker, when we put the comply or explain um, uh, encouragement policy in place, um, I fully expected that businesses would step up, that we would see an increase on boards, Mr. Speaker, because there is a strong economic imperative. We know that businesses that put women on boards do better. So I fully expected, Mr. Speaker, that, would we, that we would see a better result. That has not happened. Uh, there has not been the increase that we had expected, so we have put targets in place, Mr. Speaker. And if that doesn't work, we will be prepared to move forward with more stringent measures. But, Mr. Speaker, I completely and fully support the uh, move towards having more women involved, whether it's in Answer. the cabinet of a government, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's a board of an, of a, of an agency or a, another kind of uh, organization, or whether it's a private Thank sector you. company. We need more women involved. Thank you. Final supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, real action could come from this Premier and her Liberal government as early as Budget Day. The Pay Equity Commission's budget was cut in half by the Conservatives in 1997 wow. and has been flatlined for the last decade under the Liberals. As a result, we've seen more than half of all Ontario employers not complying with their legal pay equity obligations. The Commission needs to be fully funded so that it can actually enforce pay equity compliance and have a meaningful impact on women's lives in this province. Will the Premier's budget this spring include funding for the incredibly important work of the Pay Equity Commission? President of the Treasury Board. Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And, and obviously, we have more work to do in this area. I think everybody recognizes that. But the Ontario Public Service actually has been a leader in ad addressing the, the gender gap, wage gap. If you look at this year's data, uh, we actually have reduced the pay gap between men and women in this year's Sunshine List data from 15.8% down to 12.5%. Still more work to do. But if you look Look out at uh, who's in middle management in the public service. 55% of those positions are occupied by women. If you look at who is in the OPS senior management group, you find 52% are women. Must be the seat. A member from Kitchener Waterloo, come to order. I now have empathy. Come to order, please. <laughs> Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I, uh, I, I take responsibility for that. I'm sorry. Please finish. Yes, and where we do see a gap is women in the public service in the STEM occupations, in engineering, Answer. in physicist roles, in IT roles. And that's a gap that is reflected in society, and as an society, we need to close that. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Last week, Krista wrote to the NDP to tell us about her soaring hydro bills. She lives in Nipissing, and she's on a fixed income of $800 per month. The hydro bill she sent us was for $450.51. How does the Premier expect Krista to live and pay hydro at the same time when her bills are so high? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'm very pleased to rise and talk about Ontario's fair hydro plan that is coming, Mr. Speaker. That's going to help individuals like the individual that the uh, honourable member mentioned. Um, come this summer, Mr. Speaker, once uh, we get the legislation uh, through this House, Mr. Speaker, um, we could see up to 25 per cent in reductions for families like that, Mr. Speaker, for individuals uh, like that was mentioned. On top of that, Mr. Speaker, um, if this person is a Hydro One customer or another customer of one of the other other six uh, utilities that we've identified, their distribution costs are going to come down significantly, Mr. Speaker, bringing forward their rate of reduction um, to anywhere between 40 and 50 percent, Mr. Speaker. That is 
huge relief, Mr. Speaker, for these types of families. On top of that, we expanded the uh, Ontario Electricity yes, Support Program, uh, adding another 50 percent and actually making it loosening the rules so more people will qualify. That is a significant saving of about $554 on top of that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Krista already takes advantage of the Ontario Electricity Support Program. The Rural Rate Protection Program from is exempt from being charged for debt retirement. She still has to choose between paying her hydro bills and buying food. Clearly, the Premier and her Liberal government aren't doing enough for people like Krista. When will the Premier stop with the partisan posturing and actually present present a detailed plan in the legislature to fix the system she has helped to create in our hydro system. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, the Ontario Electricity Support Program that the member uh, mentioned that this individual has been able to take advantage of, Mr. Speaker, has increased by 50%. That will be a significant savings for this family. And with the Triple RP, um, if you uh, put that together, Mr. Speaker, this is significant savings that families are going to see, that individuals are going to see, um, you know, come summer, Mr. Speaker. And that's when, of course, our system peaks in terms of our, our costs and generation. So we're going to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we're helping these families. But there are other programs in place through the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan that are actually going to help families and individuals. You know, on top of the 25 percent that every small business yes, and farm is going to qualify for. We're bringing forward an affordability fund that they will be able to access, Mr. Speaker, that will actually help them drop their bills even further, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Again to the Premier. The Premier has not tabled legislation in this House so that Ontario families and businesses know when or if relief is coming. The only thing the Premier has done to deal with exorbitant hydro rates in the province is announce that maybe sometime in the vague future she will burden our kids and grandkids with an additional 40 billion dollars in debt that they will have to pay off when will the premier do something to help people like krista and thousands of families businesses that are suffering under the crushing weight of their hydro bills thank you minister Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, very pleased to come and talk about what we are going to do for families and individuals like Krista. 25% off, on average, by their bills on their bills, Mr. Speaker, by summer. If they are Triple RP customers, between 40 and 50%, Mr. Speaker, by summer. Enhanced OESP, 50%. Affordability fund, Mr. Speaker, bringing that forward up to $200 million. On reserve First Nations individuals, Mr. Speaker, are seeing their distribution costs waived. An $85 a month savings for these families, Mr. Speaker. When a So, Mr. Speaker, that is very clear um, relief that is coming for families right across the province. But I know the honourable member used the term vague. The only party that has a vague plan, Mr. Speaker, is the third party. It's a vague plan, Mr. Speaker, with pie in the sky thinking nothing to do to help families or low-income individuals right away. Thank you. My question the member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, I have a very straightforward question for the Premier this morning. Can she tell the House? Who is the Ombudsman at Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know recently that there's been a change within the Ombudsman uh, Department and the Ombudsperson at uh, Hydro One, um, and that's the one thing that uh, Hydro One has been working very hard at, Mr. Speaker, is, is working on getting the replacement. But the important thing to, to know, Mr. Speaker, is the Ombudsman Office is still there doing the job that it's supposed to be doing, ensuring that if people have concerns, that they can bring those concerns forward to the Ombudsman. I had several meetings with the um, the previous ombudsman from Hydro One, uh, Fiona Crane, Mr. Speaker, and she was talking about how great this company has evolved to, Mr. Speaker, and those were her words. And we're going to continue to work with Hydro One, and Hydro One's going to continue to work with uh, the ombudsman to make sure that that office plays an important role within its, uh, within its company, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Uh, uh, speaker, ba back to the Premier. Uh, I got some advice uh, for the Premier and her minister. A trans. Come to order.
The, uh, uh, don't help me. I'm trying to do something over here. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, second time. Could be your first. Question. A transparent and open government would never answer a question about who's the ombudsman by, I'll get back to you, especially at a company whose track record of customer service is one horror story after another. The former Hydro One ombudsman has left over a month ago, yet her name and her picture still are on the government website. There's no media release about her replacement. Who is this government trying to fool? This government shamefully rewrote the Electricity Minister Act Finance. to strip independent provincial watchdogs from their power on Hydro One. But Section 48.3 of the Act requires the board to have an ombudsman in place. Question. Speaker, when will the Premier and this government, when will they obey their own law? Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very pleased to once again talk about the easy. Ombudsman Office at Hydro One, and they have an acting ombudsman who's doing great work with the company, Mr. Speaker, making sure that the office is still there, doing the job it's supposed to do, Mr. Speaker. The, the former ombudsman took another job, Mr. Speaker, just like other people do, right? We wish her well. She did great work while she was working for uh, Hydro One for the last year. And in my last meeting with her, Mr. Speaker, you know what she said? That this company has really turned around. It is now customer focused. It is making sure it's doing a better job in meeting the needs of its customers. And they would have never have acted on the winter uh, reconnection piece that they did in the past. But that's what happens, Mr. Speaker, when you don't have a plan for Ontario, or if you don't have a plan on what to do, like electricity. Like We're going to warnings. We're going to warnings. New question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Incidents of violence in our classrooms are increasing across the province. We're hearing heartbreaking and horror stories from our teachers and our parents, and I don't believe this government is listening. Instead of supporting our students and the education system, this government continues to slash funding for classroom supports. Children as young as four or five are stuck on growing wait lists for the vital early interventions that they need. As a teacher, I've seen the disruption this causes in classrooms and the danger it presents students firsthand. How does the Premier plan to make our schools safer when she won't even provide the basic supports that students need to succeed? Minister of Education. Of education. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member opposite for the question, Mr. Speaker. The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, any incident of violence in our schools is unacceptable. Um, we have to ensure that our school communities are safe for students, for teachers, for education workers, Mr. Speaker. And it's very important that if an incident occurs, that a school board has protocols and policies in place, uh, Mr. Speaker, that can respond uh, appropriately to that incident, and that there are reporting mechanisms in place um, as well. Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, we have to provide the, the right level of support to ensure that the culture of safety is promoted in our schools. And we're working together with our education partners, including at full members who are here today, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Just last year, we had a half day devoted in professional development to the health and safety uh, of, our, our, of our workers. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Teachers and education workers have some of the highest levels of lost time due to injuries as a result of workplace violence. When we're talking about their workplace, we're talking about the classroom. So that means that students are at risk too. As an EPFO member, I know and appreciate that every student has the right to an education and the right to reach their full potential. And it is this government's obligation to support them, to keep them safe and ensure that they can learn. How are we supposed to believe that you are serious about addressing violence in school when you continue to cut supports for students in our classrooms? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, that's simply not true. Mr. Speaker, we are increasing our supports in education. Just take, for example, Mr. Speaker, um, we have increased education assistance by 37 
percent, Mr. Speaker. Since 2013, um, 6,300 education uh, assistants. Mr. Speaker, we have a provincial health and safety working group, Mr. Speaker, that we are working together with all of our education partners to strengthen the culture of health and safety. Mr. Speaker, I can go on, but I want to say to the member opposite that in their plan for uh, education when they ran in 2014, your Remember plan that. was to cut supports from health Shameful. and from education Shame workers. On you. Your proposal was to bring forward $600 million in Answer. cuts. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue on this side of the House to invest in our publicly funded education system. Here, here. Your question to Member Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. We all know that both 2016 and the start of 2017 have seen many global uncertainties emerge, both politically and economically. I know that Ontario's economy remains poised to lead Canada in growth and has remained strong through the uncertainty. However, my constituents of Kingston and the Islands and I both have growing concerns over what we're doing as a province to defend our jobs and maintain our access to trade. This is particularly important to me as well as our Greater Chamber of Commerce and other Kingston businesses. We need to ensure that we're maintaining strong relationships with our biggest trading partner, the U.S. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, what are you specifically doing Question. to reassure Ontario families and businesses that we're aware of the importance of our integrated economy Thank and defending you. Ontario's interests? Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Ontario and the U.S. have uh, have enjoyed and still enjoy a very strong relationship, Mr. Speaker. Strong, balanced economic relationship, and that relationship is fundamental to our prosperity here in Ontario. Um, the the work that we have been doing, Mr. Speaker, to work with our partners in uh, in the federal and Quebec governments to ensure that Canada was top of mind as a discussion around Buy American took place in New York, Mr. Speaker, is, uh, is indicative of how much we value that relationship. And so the Minister of International Trade and the Minister of Economic Development and Growth both went to Albany, Mr. Speaker. They talked with many, many leaders there. They worked with our representative in Washington, uh, who was on the ground in Albany as well, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. And we're going to continue to engage with workers and with businesses, Mr. Speaker. As a result, we were, were very pleased that the Buy American Thank provisions you. were dropped for the New York. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Premier. My question is again through you to the Premier. With so many of Ontario's industries and jobs directly impacted by our neighbours to the south, especially those in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, we need to show strength as we now turn our attention to discussions on NAFTA. This is particularly important to businesses in Kingston as well as all other border communities. We need to maintain momentum as we defend our economy and position Ontario for long-term success. Although Buy America is off the table now, there are other issues around a border adjustment tax as well as ensuring Ontario's views are heard at the NAFTA negotiating table. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Premier, what are you specifically doing to reassure Ontario families and businesses that as we enter discussions on NAFTA and other key issues, we will Question. be represented? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So let me just begin by saying that um, we are in a, a, a very uncertain time in terms of the policies south of the border, Mr. Speaker, and I would say beyond. But specifically in relation to our, uh, our partners in the United States, we are going to continue to engage in conversations, as the member from Kingston and the Islands has said, um, on the border adjustment tax, Mr. Speaker, on NAFTA. And even though the Buy American provisions have been dropped from the New York budget, Mr. Speaker, that does not mean that we don't have to continue to be vigilant because that 
protectionist rhetoric, Mr. Speaker, is still part of the political discourse. So we are going to continue to work. I am going to, for example, Mr. Speaker, I will be attending the, attending the uh, Governors Association, the National Governors Association in Rhode Island in July, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I was just in Chicago yesterday meeting with Governor uh, Rauner of, uh, of Illinois, and I will continue to engage well, with governors around the state to make Thank you. Talk to talk to you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start the clock. New question, the member from Halliburton Corporation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Status of Women. Today is Pay Equity Day, which marks 30 years since the unanimous passage of Ontario's Pay Equity Act. Unfortunately, we haven't been making much progress on pay equity under this Liberal government. On average, women in Ontario are paid 30 per cent less for doing the same work as men, a gap that is only 6 per cent smaller than it was at the time of the Act's passage. Despite these worrying statistics, this government has ignored this issue until last year when all they did was strike yet another committee. Even now, the story has been one of delay and endless consultation rather than action. So my question to the minister is, why has it taken this government almost 14 years to admit that they need to address pay equity in this province? The minister of the Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am pleased to uh, rise today and speak on Pay Equity Day on what I think is a very important issue. First off, I want to point out to the member opposite that this is the side of the House that actually took action on this. With the Premier's assignment of a Ministry of the Status of Women and the first standalone minister uh, responsible for early years and childcare, we are taking actual concrete steps towards closing the gender wage gap. And the number one recommendation on the steer from the steering committee on closing the gender wage gap was to invest in childcare. Right. And guess what? We're doing that. We are transforming the way we are delivering childcare. We have, we have uh, committed to creating 100,000 new childcare, licensed childcare spaces over the next five years, doubling what we already Sir. have. But that's not all. I'm very happy to talk about more of the work that we are doing. Uh, back to the minister. This government likes to talk a big game on this file, but they are living in a bubble of self-delusion. Here, here. The reality on the ground is that the situation of working women remains largely unchanged under their watch, and that is simply unacceptable. The government only appointed a dedicated status of women minister this past January, I guess because it's 2017. As I mentioned, the House yesterday, all the government has done is strike a closed-door committee on pay equity to further review the recommendations already made by an expert committee reported on pay equity in 2016. Delay and inaction is the name of this government's game, but Ontario women aren't fooled. So my question to the minister is, will the government take responsibility for their inaction and admit question. that it has no real plan to help working women in Ontario finally achieve equality in the workplace? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, I find it surprising that the member opposite is actually talking about inaction when I haven't seen any action from that side of the House on this issue over the next part of this Day in and day out, I sit in this House and listen to the criticism that is lobbed from that side of the House to us. Well, let me tell you something. We are doers. We are, actually, we are acting on this file. We are solving the issue. So, on Finish, please. I am working closely with my colleague, the Minister of Labour, when it comes to closing the gender wage yes, gap, and this includes the pay equity issue. In fact, Ontario has made great strides when it comes to improving women's economic empowerment. We are leaders in Thank this you. field. Our commitments to end sexual. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start the clock.
New question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Under the water in Thunder Bay's North Harbour, there is a massive mercury contamination that is the result of decades of discharge from a paper mill that closed a long time ago. Imagine nearly 400,000 cubic meters of soggy paper towels full of mercury covering over 50 football fields worth of lake bed. In 2014, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, along with federal partners, presented a report outlining options to clean up North Harbour. An action plan was supposed to follow. Three years later, the people of Thunder Bay are still waiting for the cleanup plan. Where is it? Yeah, where is it? Thank you. Mr. Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member raising that a very important question. And I would uh, be glad to sit down with him and other members to go through the details of that file. Mm -hmm. um, this government has taken unprecedented action on mercury after 60 years of inaction and contamination. Uh, the neglect of Hamilton Harbour, only finally under this government, is that harbour being cleaned up in full partnership with the federal government. Grassy Narrows, after 60 years of neglect, finally after 60 years of government sitting in this house and doing that. Uh, the details uh, on, on where we're at on Thunder Bay, if you had given me a little heads up about the question, I would be glad to get, get the details. But I, I, will, I will sit down with my ministry, Mr. Speaker. I will pull the file and get the details. As you know, there is no lack of action on mercury in, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again, to the minister, the International Joint Commission identified Thunder Bay's North Harbour as an area of concern over three decades ago. Over 30 years has passed, and there has been no action to clean up the mercury. Three years ago, we were promised an action plan. Three years later, we're still waiting. How much longer must the people of Thunder Bay wait for the government to take action? Mr. Speaker, no government in 60 years has taken greater action on mercury than this government. No, no government, including the party opposite, sat on its hands while people In case I forgot to remind you, we're in warnings. That'll be my last warning about warnings. As I said, including the party opposite, who took no action on mercury for, for even five seconds, Mr. Speaker, when they were in government. The record in Ontario on dealing with mercury over the last half century, Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, has been shameful. And, and, and Mr. Sir? Speaker, it was only this government that took on the issues in Hamilton Harbour. That I will look into the issue Thank because you. I know there is a great deal of work being done on it. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Today, April 11th, is Equal Pay Day in Ontario. To recognize that a pay gap still exists between men and women in the province and across the world, Equal Pay Day serves as a symbolic reminder of the extra time each year that it takes a woman, on average, to earn as much as a man. In 2017, it. Uh, it's 2017, and this disadvantage towards women, sadly, should not still exist. Indeed. The women in my riding of Barrie deserve to see change. The women across our province deserve to see change. In the minister's mandate letter from the premier, she asked him to lead the development of a wage gap strategy to close the gap between men and women. I'm proud to be a member of a government that is taking uh, action on this issue very seriously, Question. helping to lead the way in Canada. Can the minister please share with this House what he is doing to help improve the working lives of women across the province and close the gender wage gap? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I I want to thank the member from Barrie for that excellent question. Speaker, last year, after holding consultations right across this province, we engaged with over 170 stakeholders, hundreds of members of the public, men and women came out, Speaker, to offer their advice during public town hall sessions. 
thousands of online submissions. The Gender Wage Gap uh, Working Committee Steering Committee released its final report and its final recommendation, Speaker. And I want to thank them for the hard work. I know that members of the opposition have denigrated that work, Speaker. I think it's excellent work. As a result of that, we've established a working group now. We've got reps from business, labour, women's advocacy groups, human resources experts. They're going to provide practical feedback, Speaker. First group, uh, the first meeting of this group is this Thursday. I look forward to being there. S Equal Pay Day really serves as that symbolic reminder of the barrier that still exists yes, for women. And as a government, we know it's imperative. The member from Barrie is absolutely right. We need to close the agenda. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for your response. I'm glad to hear that work continues to close the gender wage gap through the development of a gender wage gap working group. As members of this House know, the gender wage gap still unfairly disadvantages women in my riding of Barrie, right. across Ontario, and, other, and in every other jurisdiction. When women workers are treated equitably, everyone benefits. The number one recommendation from the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee was that government invest in child care, working women and their families. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what are we doing to address these recommendations? Thank you, Minister. Uh, the Minister of the Status of Women, Speaker. Minister of the Status of Women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the hardworking member for this very important question and for her strong advocacy on this issue. It's true that the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee's top recommendation, top number one and two recommendations, was an immediate investment in childcare. And in the speech from the throne, the government did just that. Here, here. We announced a plan to create 100,000 new licensed childcare spaces. Historic. It's the right thing to do. Wow. But there's more hard work underway in government, including strengthening the application of gender-based analysis in government decision-making and committing to increasing the number of women on boards. For example, we're among the first jurisdictions to introduce, introduce comply or explain rules, government targets of 40 percent for women on provincial agencies, business targets of 30 percent for women on boards and in senior executive positions. Yes, uh, speaker, we must ensure that all women from all walks of life find economic security. There's a need for an integrated whole of government Thank approach, you. and we're working on that. Thank you. New question. The member, the member from Dr. Calhoun. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we're learning more and more about the terrible abuse of taxpayers' dollars and an unprecedented amount of waste at the York Region School Board. Trustee travel and spending appears to be out of control. Will, sorry, my apologies, uh, to the Premier. Premier, Will you put a moratorium on travel for the York Region District School Board trustees? Good question. Okay. Minister of Education. Education. Mr. Speaker, um, for many, many months, uh, we've been dealing with the situation at the York Region District School Board. I've heard from parents, I've heard from students, and from the community, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly why, in January, I appointed uh, a, a set of reviewers, uh, Sue Herbert and Patrick Case, who have been working with the community to uh, to hear those concerns, and they have put forward uh, their recommendations, Mr. Speaker. And the reason why, uh, Mr. Speaker, we went this route to an expedited review is because we know that our schools must be places that all students feel safe, Mr. Speaker, and that any in incidences that affects that well-being of the student is addressed and that we don't shy away from those concerns. So, Mr. Speaker, that report Answer. has been submitted to me. I am reviewing that report, and I will have more to say on that. Um, hey, uh, in the, in thank you. So the minister just acknowledges she's known about it since January, but she didn't put a moratorium in place. Why not? Former Liberal candidate Laura Lee Carruthers promised to regain the public's trust when she became chair of the board last December. This travel spending scandal certainly isn't a good step. It appears trustees use the board as a taxpayer-funded travel agent. Wow. They just set it across Europe with no regard for public funds. This travel is unacceptable and unnecessary. Will the government commit to reviewing all travel expenses and calling for the funds to be reimbursed? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, um, the member opposite knows full well that this issue has been brought forward and that we are taking action to address the concerns that have been raised by parents, by students, and by the community. Mr. Speaker, that is why I have asked for a review of the leadership uh, of the York Region District School Board and uh, and ensuring that when we hear issues, that they are dealt with. Mr. Speaker, I have heard from many members and colleagues on this side of the house in York Region about the concerns that they were hearing from their community. It is the the first time in many weeks and many months that the member opposite has raised those concerns. So I'm happy to stand in this first house time. and tell you the actions that we are taking, Answer. Mr. Speaker, Real because action. those actions are meant to ensure that our students get the best Thank education you. possible. New question, the The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Late last year, tenants at 401 Richmond in Toronto received an incredible shock. Their property taxes were about to triple, threatening this cultural hub, which provides below market rents to arts organizations and creative industries in downtown Toronto. Taxes were tripling because MPAC does not assess properties like 401 Richmond based on the current use of the property, but on the value of the condo tower MPAC imagines might stand in its place. The City of Toronto wants a new property tax class for cultural hubs like 401 Richmond. Will the minister enable such a property tax class and save buildings like 401 Richmond? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I appreciate the question. I mean, we all value the contributions of not-for-profit and the cultural community and the art community, especially at the 401 Richmond, which for a long time now have been providing a great service uh, to our community, and we want that to continue. We also recognize that the City of Toronto has at their disposal the opportunity to provide uh, for some reductions directly. Uh, the city has the authority to provide property tax rebates directly to not-for-profit organizations, regardless of whether they are the owner or the tenant of the property. Bottom line, the approval of the province is not required for them to provide the immediate uh, uh, service and, and uh, rebate to, to the area. Thank you, Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The highest and best use, which was the term used by MPAC of 401 Richmond, is not to become another condo tower. By providing a home for Toronto's artists and creative industries, 401 Richmond is already serving its highest and best use. Toronto has specifically asked this minister for the ability to protect such cultural hubs without having to resort to ad hoc property tax workarounds, which is what they've done. Will the minister finally agree to create a new property tax class for cultural hubs and heritage buildings like 401 Richmond? Help the City of Toronto. Um, oh, Mr. Speaker, we absolutely want to support 401 Richmond. We want to provide and encourage the city, who, by the way, does have the ability to give a property tax rebate of up to 40 percent of the property taxes paid by the eligible heritage buildings. As the taxing authority, it is up to the city to decide whether to provide property tax relief to specific heritage buildings within Toronto. They can do that, and we would encourage them to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And your question, the member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is, is for the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs. Minister, we have been hearing recently from members opposite making some false, misleading claims about Ontario's greenhouse industry. Despite what the opposition may believe, the industry is growing and has the full support of our government. We have committed more than $10.7 million to 440 projects in the greenhouse industry since 2013. And just last month, I had the pleasure of being joined by Minister Leal at Lynx Greenhouse in my riding of Durham to announce that the province is investing $19 million towards the greenhouse competitiveness and innovation initiative. In addition, through go grow, growing forward to our government launch Question. new project categories, Mr. Speaker. Minister, can you please explain what else our government is doing to support the greenhouse Thank sector you. and update? Stop the clock. 
in the member's preamble, he made a, a comment that I'm not accepting as parliamentary, and I ask him to withdraw. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Mr. of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the question from the hardworking member from Durham Riding this morning. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's greenhouse sector is growing. Uh, today, we learned that Natural Fresh Farms is building a new $400 million distribution centre in wonderful Leamington, Ontario. Excellent. Recently, Greenhouse Produce announced a new $100 million development that will create 300 new jobs. Uh, this builds on the nearly 3,000 acres and 81,000 jobs already in this sector. The Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers also expect the industry to keep growing by about 150 acres a year. This is real growth, regardless of what others may say. Yeah, We're also partnering with the industry to build on these. Down. Just last month, at Leak Greenhouses in beautiful Bowmanville, Ontario, our government announced a $19 billion funding to support the Greenhouse Competitive and Innovation Initiative. Answer. The Climate Action Plan has allocated $115 billion to cover agricultural producers. This is the kind of innovation we're investing in Ontario. Thank you to the minister for that response. It's good to hear that the greenhouse industry is continuing to expand and invest in my riding of Durham, as well as the rest of our great province. Just like any other business, there is a wide array of factors that impact this industry, industry's decision to invest in our province. Our government works closely with the industry stakeholders, like the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance, the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers, and more. And once we have heard from our industry partners and my constituents, it's over the cost of electricity, concerns over the cost of electricity, Mr. Speaker. The government recently announced our Fair Hydro Plan, which is reducing bills by 25% and average by this summer. Greenhouse Questions? owners are wondering whether and, whether and how to savings will apply to them. Minister. Please share with the House how the Fair Hydro Plan will Thank reduce you. electricity costs for greenhouse. Mr. Question to the Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for the question and for his hard work. Um, it is a pleasure to be able to speak about our government's Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. And, and as members of this House will know, part of our plan involves lowering the threshold for participation in the Industrial Conservation Initiative, Mr. Speaker. Participants in the ICI program can save as much as one third off their electricity costs. And we will be lowering the threshold from one megawatt to 500 kilowatts for many energy intensive businesses. And I'm pleased to say today that greenhouses will be counted among that group, Mr. Speaker. Any greenhouse that uses more than 500 kilowatts in electricity demand will be eligible for that program. And as members of this House know, Mr. Speaker, Ontario farms are benefiting from Ontario's Fair Hydro Answer. Plan. That means for those greenhouses who don't qualify for the ICI program, they'll still be eligible, Mr. Mr. Speaker, for that 25 per cent reduction as well. Hey, hey, good. And the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Speaker to the Minister of Education. On March 28, 2017, in the Legislature, the minister said, we know that schools play a vital role in the social fabric that ties our great communities together. <laughs> our local schools are really the center of communities. Yeah. Speaker, if the minister truly believes that, will she stop closing schools? You don't know when, but I will. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, you know, on this side of the House, we continue to invest in our great education system here yeah. in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Um, in fact, you know, as the Premier said earlier, 810 new schools have been built in this Incredible. province, Mr. Speaker, including 450. 
50 of those in rural communities alone. Wow. We've expanded 780 schools significantly, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to invest in our public education system, Mr. Nobody Speaker, endure. because we know that schools are the heart of communities, Mr. Speaker, and that we are providing the best education possible. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to support our local school boards as they make very difficult decisions right. when there is a need to change a school for whatever the reason is in that local community, Mr. Speaker. Answer. We want to ensure that they have the resources, that they can continuously invest in the education of our students so that yeah. they can get the best education. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Education. There's hundreds of schools being considered for closure by this government. And Liberal members missed their opportunity to stand up for students and families when they voted against an immediate moratorium on school closures. But, Speaker, Speaker, there's still an opportunity for the government to take ownership and say no more school closures. No more. Speaker, when will this government do the right thing and support our call for an immediate moratorium on school closures? Please. Please it, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, you know it's important that we we don't. Um, it, it, look at just a one-size-fits-all solution, because we actually know that local communities are going to be responsible for making those decisions locally, and that's why we support our school boards. In fact, a member opposite, in his own party, here is, and I quote, a tough piece of reality for everyone to accept is that student enrollment is on the decline, which is putting everybody in tough situations. But we have to stand tall and we have to what? work with realities we have in front of us. This is from uh, MPP Lisa Thompson from the Owen Sound oh. Times. You know, Mr. Speaker, we are investing in our, in our school communities in the members' own riding 11 new and improved new schools, schools since 2003 have Answer. been built. So we have to ensure that as we're making Making these decisions that they are appropriate for our local Thank community you. and that we're providing no question the member from London Fanshawe my question is to the premier constituents are calling my London office to tell me that they can't afford their hydro bills they are shocked at the rates that they're being charged and they're desperate for relief one particularly heartbreaking story was from a young couple with a baby only a few months old. Because they can't afford their hydro bill, this young mom spends her days at her parents' house to save time of use charges. But that hasn't worked. Their bills haven't changed. Premier, can you imagine the frustration and the anger these young parents are feeling because they are forced to choose between paying for your government's hydro schemes or providing for their family. Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Energy will want to speak to the specifics of our Fair Hydro Plan, but Mr. Speaker, it is exactly because of situations like the one the member opposite has uh, articulated that we knew that even with the measures we had taken, uh, the 8 percent, Mr. Speaker, the reduction that was in place as of January 1st, that we needed to do more. We knew that we needed to do more, so another 17 percent reduction will mean that that young family will see a 20 percent reduction on their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker, come the summer. So it was exactly those situations where uh, families, people were carrying too much of a burden, Mr. Speaker, too much of a burden for uh, investments and upgrading of a system that is going to last for generations. But we were asking those people to pay now, Mr. Speaker, and a yes, disproportionate amount. We're spreading those costs over a longer period of time, and that's how a 25 percent reduction will be seen on those Thank bills you. come September. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, there's no comfort in passing on debt to the next generation. Premier, this young family lives in a semi-detached, nothing large. They don't have electric heat, nor do they live in their own house during the day. Despite taking drastic measures, like not living in their home during the day, their hydro bills are still way too high. Premier, you have failed young families like my constituents, and worse, you have put their ability to provide for their child at risk. When will this government 
take responsibility for their failed energy policies that you are forcing young families to pay for? And when will we see your new Liberal plan? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's good news for families like what the honourable uh, mention, member mentioned in relation to our Fair Hydro plan. Uh, up to 25 per cent, or on average 25 per cent, will be coming to actually help families just like them, Mr. Speaker. And that's good news for every family right across the province. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, if this family qualifies, if they're low income, Mr. Speaker, we'll make sure that they can get access to the Ontario Electricity Support Program, where they'll actually see an additional 50 per cent, Mr. Speaker, to help them. And that's what we're making sure that we're doing, Mr. Speaker, helping every single family, small business, and farm in this. This province through the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, one party has no plan. The other one has a plan Answer. that does vague context, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't take one cent off of anybody's bills, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. We're doing more than that. We're taking 20. Thank you. The government house leader on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Acknowledge me. I want to uh, welcome some guests from Parkinson Canada who's with us here today in the House. Please welcome Daphne Fitzgerald, Yvonne Trepanier, John Carey, Ryan Tripp, Debbie Davis, Jacques McAuliffe, Megan Boyle, Paul Skibira, Wen Zi, and Sprague Plato. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport, Point of Order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd also like to welcome some constituents uh, to uh, the Legislature today from Burlington. Lauren Stasiak, Rob Peachy, Natasha Husgard, Johanna Kite from the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects, and Blair Chesterton from the Ontario Electrical League. Welcome to Queen's Park. Speaker, I'd like to, uh, point of order, to correct my record. Um, since uh, 2003, we have um, uh, invested in 6,300 uh, new wow. education assistants, and it's since 2013, 900 have been added, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's not correcting your record, and I don't want to see that happen again. You said the wrong number? My apologies. My apologies. 2003. Thank you. We have a deferred vote. On the motion of closure for the motion to second reading of Bill 65, call on the members. This will be a five minute bill.
All members, take your seats, please. Thank you. On February 21, 2017, Mr. Del Duca moved second reading of Bill 65, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act in respect to speed limits in municipalities and other matters. Mr. Flynn has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Flynn's uh, motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Malone. Madame Malone. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrill. Mr. Morrill. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Pot. Mr. Pot. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Ronaldo. Mr. Renil. Mr. Renil. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Uh, Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 51, the nays are 41. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Del Duca has moved second reading of Bill 65, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act uh, in respect and speed limits of municipalities and other matters. Is it the pleasure of the House motion carried? No. I heard a no. All those, uh, uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call on the members, this will be a five-minute bell. Mr. Del Duca has moved second reading of Bill 65, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act with respect to the speed limits in municipalities and other matters. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nack Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Charles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. 
Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mrs. Jassic. Mrs. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Nidu Harris. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Hogarth. Mr. Koala. Mr. Koala. Mr. Molly. Mr. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton, East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Jelena. Mr. Jelena. Mr. Fife. Mr. Fife. Mr. Manta. Mr. Manta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Powell. Mr. Powell. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. The ayes are 68, the nays are 24. The ayes being 68 and the nays being 24, I declare the motion carried. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Transportation. I would ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. We'll refer. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.